This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to Egypt, where there are new revelations that members of the army participated in the forced disappearance, torture and killing of protesters during the 2011 uprising that led to the ouster of President Hosni Mubarak. The details are included in a report submitted to President Mohamed Morsi by his own hand-picked committee. The report is not yet public, but The Guardian obtained a copy of a chapter that examines the crimes against civilians, beginning with the Army's first deployment to the streets. More than 1,000 people went missing during the 18 days of the revolution. Many later turned up in Egypt's morgues, either shot or bearing signs of torture. Despite the allegations, President Morsi has declined to prosecute any officers since he assumed power from the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces after his election in June. But the leaked chapter recommends that he investigate the highest ranks of the military to determine who was responsible. This comes as Mubarak and his former interior minister, Habib al-Adli, are set to return to court Saturday to face charges that they are responsible for killing protesters during the uprising. For more, we're joined by Sharif abdel Kadus, Democracy Now! correspondent, fellow at the Nation Institute. He's usually based in Cairo, but happily joins us here in our New York studio, along with Lina Atala, chief editor of Egypt Independent, a Cairo-based English-language newspaper and website. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Sharif, talk about this explosion. Explosive new report. Well, it's an interesting report. The most uh, explosive part of it is that uh, it's it was uh, conducted by a fact-finding commission that was handpicked by the president himself. Uh, many local Egyptian human rights groups have long documented abuses by the army. Uh, these abuses were also uh, broadcast internationally when we had uh, things like uh, forced so-called virginity tests on March 9th of protesters arrested in Tahrir, uh, perhaps one of the bloodiest incidents uh, in the past two years, the killing of 27 people, mostly Coptic Christian demonstrators uh, uh, in downtown Cairo on October 9th. Um, and of course, the putting of 12,000 uh, civilians on military trial more than Mubarak's three decades in power. So military abuses have uh, been long known in Egypt. What is significant is that this is a commission handpicked by Morsi, uh, and it puts pressure uh, on uh, the government to uh, f put uh, the army officers on trial. However, the constitution that we have in Egypt that was uh, drafted by a body dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood and its allies and passed in a controversial referendum ensures that the military can only be tried by in a military tribunal. Only army members, army members can only be put on trial uh, by a military tribunal, which, uh, you know, finding justice in that system will be very, very difficult. And also this comes in the wake of another leak of the same report last month to the Associated Press that found that police in Egypt killed nearly all of the 900 protesters that were uh, killed uh, in the 18-day uprising. Again, this is not news to Egyptians who saw with their eyes police killing people. But uh, this is evidence that uh, and puts pressure on the government and the prosecutor general to hold those accountable uh, who committed these crimes and to stop uh, this lack of justice and continuation of, of impunity in Egypt for these crimes. But what does the Constitution say about the, po the police as, as, as distinct from the military? Are they also uh, are they also subject to civilian courts or military courts? There are uh, civilian courts, and over the past two years, uh, hundreds of police officers have been acquitted by this court system that has completely failed. Uh, to hold anybody accountable. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Constitution gave the military everything it wanted and more, and one of those was that its, uh, it, its members would only be tried in a military tribunal. According to the leaked report, investigators found members of the armed forces uh, detained a number of civilians at a checkpoint outside Cairo who have not been seen again. It said, quote, the committee found that a number of citizens died during their detention by the armed forces and that they were buried in indigent graves as they were considered unidentified. The report added authorities did not investigate despite evidence of injuries and severe torture. Lena Atala, can you talk more about that? Uh, like Sharif said, we are not surprised by these results, although these results, uh, with the level of detail they offer, they present uh, important corroborative evidence that implicate uh, the army in the killing of protesters um, uh, during the revolution. And this changes the dominant narrative that basically the army has protected the revolution, and if it wasn't for the army intervention, it would have been a bloodbath back in 28 January 
2011. So this is very important at a time when uh, the political situation in Egypt is very unstable and there is a lot of talk about uh, the potential return of the army in order to solve the current uh, political stal stalemate. If anything, it reminds people that um, the military rule uh, is uh, as problematic um, as the current Islamist regime. Uh, and um, it also brings uh, to all our attention the very critical issue of impunity. And Lita, when you talk about the, uh, the continuing unstable situation, I'd like to ask you about this whole issue of sectarian violence, of the, of the uh, uh, increasing uh, violence between Coptic Christians and Muslims, and how that is affecting the general uh, democracy movement uh, in Egypt. Um, so we have seen we have seen in the last few days another uh, wave of uh, violence uh, uh, against Christians uh, in, a, in a small village um, outside of Cairo, and we've seen also that in the aftermath of this violence during the funeral, uh, the Coptic Cathedral uh, in Cairo, which is an important symbol of Christian faith, has also been attacked during the funeral, uh, which is uh, which is a grave uh, violation. If anything, it tells us that um, the current regime, like the previous one, um, acts uh, with a lot of um, um, carelessness and nonchalance towards uh, the question of sectarianism that is extremely prevalent in Cairo, uh, in Egypt, and that is um, both representative of a societal <coughs> problem, but also uh, further fueled uh, by uh, the state not acting responsibly in bringing uh, those responsible uh, to justice. And, and also, just to add to that, um, sectarianism is a problem, a long-standing problem in Egypt that's regularly been swept under the carpet by uh, regimes, successive regimes, saying this is, these are isolated incidents by outside forces seeking to destabilize the country and not acknowledging this problem. Uh, and with the current regime, uh, you know, th there's been members of the Muslim Brotherhood that have taken to the airwaves and used sectarian language that helps create this environment where uh, this kind of violence can happen. Mohammed al Biltegi, who is a leading Brotherhood member who was seen for years as a reformist member of the group, uh, in November when there were clashes, or sorry, in December when there were clashes at the presidential palace, said that, uh, you know, over 60 percent of the people protesting the president were Christian. Um, the uh, online Ikhwan uh, web, which is the online site for the Muslim Brotherhood has regularly accused Christians of trying to sabotage elections uh, and, and things of this nature. So it's this kind of language that has helped to, uh, to foment this violence as well. Um, on Wednesday, uh, the Egyptian President Morsi withdrew complaints against several journalists who were under investigation for allegedly insulting him and the Muslim faith. But the popular television satirist, uh, the comedian uh, Bassem Youssef, is among those still facing charges. This is a clip of Youssef speaking last month on his weekly show. What do you have planned for us, Mr. President? And I'd also like to ask him on the Renaissance program. I do not have any personal vendettas against anyone. On the contrary, it would be an honor for me to host any of those I criticize. It would be a success for myself and also a success for freedom of thought and expression, as it would send a message to the people that they, the Muslim Brotherhood, are in power, they accept criticism, and once they leave the show, I still criticize them. This happens all over the world, so why can't it be for us? That was the popular Egyptian television satirist Bassem Youssef. The U.S. says the charges come as Egypt has failed to investigate cases of extreme police brutality against protesters while continuing its crackdown on freedom of expression. We're going to turn right now to John Stewart. Um, uh, yes, comedian John Stewart here in the United States, who was defending Bassem Youssef earlier this month on The Daily Show. Um, this is John Stewart addressing Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi. Well, come on! Charging Bassem Youssef with insulting Egypt and Islam? I know Bassem. Bassem is my friend, my brother. There are two things he loves in this world with all his heart, Egypt and Islam, and, and his family. The three things. There's three. And uh, uh, what is that flatbread with the cheese? It's tart. It's like a white. It's not Baba Gunda. It's like there's four things that he loves. <laughs> My point is, Bassem Yosef loves Egypt so much, he chooses to live there, even though some crazy guy is threatening to arrest him. Uh, oh, right. Um, <laughs> but by the way, without Bassem, and all those journalists and bloggers and brave protesters who took to Tahrir Square to voice dissent, you, President Morsi, would not be in a position to repress them. For someone who spent time in jail yourself. For someone, for someone who spent time in jail yourself under Mubarak, you seem awfully eager to send other people there for the same non-crimes. 
And just like you, they will only emerge from prison stronger and more determined. So all sending comedians and bloggers to prison accomplishes is lowering the quality of prison yard athletics. <laughs> That was John Stewart uh, talking about Boston Yusuf, the significance of Yusuf. Well, he's got one of the most popular programs in Egypt uh, and uses satire, much like uh, John Stewart does on The Daily Show, uh, to lampoon and to make fun of uh, the, uh, the current regime, mostly uh, the Islamist president. And this is something very hard to retaliate against, humor. It's a weapon uh, that's been used by many people in Egypt uh, to challenge the regime. And we saw, you know, these charges of insulting the president and uh, that, that that have been used against uh, many journalists and activists as well uh, to uh, clamp down on dissent. Uh, Bessem Youssef is someone who's known around the world. John Stewart knows him, and he's someone probably will not be jailed because of his high profile. But there's many activists in Egypt uh, who are facing serious uh, jail time. One of them is Hassan Mustafa, an, an activist in Alexandria who received a two-year jail sentence for allegedly slapping a prosecutor. Uh, and many eyewitnesses around him deny uh, those charges, as does he. Uh, and of course, many, many uh, people arrested, killed during demonstrations who don't get this kind of uh, uh, this coverage. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, again, uh, Stuart put it uh, very well, saying that um, these, these are the people, many of them elected Morsi uh, against uh, his opponent, Ahmed Shafi, who represented the military establishment and returned to the former regime. And now he's cracking down on them. So, well, Lena, you also uh, edited a newspaper and an online news uh, site. What is life like in Egypt today for the press compared to uh, under Mubarak? And what are the challenges that you're facing right now in being able to get accurate news and information out to the people? Well, while, of course, uh, currently we're enjoying um, um, a dynamic political scene uh, that is making us write and report about Egypt in uh, many more creative ways than before, um, one of the problems, besides, of course, the political and legislative uh, uh, limitations that are cast upon uh, the media landscape in Egypt, there are also a lot of economic, uh, economic um, challenges uh, that also, in a way, uh, mask uh, a deeper political problem. So a lot of the uh, media in Egypt, if not controlled by the state, are controlled by business conglomerates uh, um, who do not have real business development models um, for our newspapers and our television uh, channels, and they highly depend on the subsidization um, of these businessmen. So the moment uh, a businessman loses interest in uh, a particular uh, medium, uh, no matter how successful this medium has become, um, what happens is that it faces the threat of Closure, which is actually uh, the story of Egypt Independent uh, for which I'm working and which we are working hard on trying to save uh, because we think uh, we present a very important narrative uh, both uh, in Egypt and outside of Egypt about the situation that cannot otherwise be provided by um, only international journalists, for example. How can you save it? Uh, we are basically trying to develop uh, an alternative uh, business model, uh, which basically entices um, a lot of our readers to contribute uh, to the, the survival of the paper so, through a subscription drive. And this is also to open up a culture whereby uh, readers should share the ownership of uh, their media um, and not just uh, leave them uh, to the subsidization and the control of their businessmen. And in a way, of course, democracy now is an inspiration for us. And what is it for you as a woman? How is it for you to report in Egypt and the climate for women overall? Um, it has been, of course, challenging as much as it, well, it has been for men, particularly uh, covering um, covering clashes, covering incidents of violence, uh, uh, where you know there is uh, there is much chaos and there is uh, no much security in there. So we basically, uh, of all of us, uh, endanger ourselves uh, for the sake of getting the story out. There are, of course, um, some additional threats uh, for women with regards to um, uh, mounting reports about sexual violence, uh, particularly around Tahrir Square. Uh, but we also should remember uh, that uh, the question of uh, sexual violence uh, has been there for a longer time um, and should be addressed both politically and, um, and socially. Uh, but in general, I would say um, um, it has been as challenging as it has been for men uh, to cover the Egypt story with honesty. 
Uh, and Sharif, we just have about a minute, but I wanted to ask you about the impact of outside forces on the Egyptian economy. The, uh, uh, there was a, a, a recent controversy over an IMF loan, and then Qatar and Libya have all suddenly come in to offer aid to Egypt. What's the, the impact of these outside players on the Egypt situation? That's right. Egypt's uh, economic crisis uh, centers largely around uh, foreign currency reserves, of which uh, we've lost about $20 billion, uh, in trying to support the pound. Um, and uh, this is a real crisis. And so Qatar has stepped in with $5 billion and just uh, a couple of days ago agreed to uh, inject an additional $3 billion uh, into the economy. Libya, a country which went through a civil war, is giving Egypt $2 billion. Uh, Saudi Arabia has, has given $1 billion. Turkey has given $2 billion. Without these, this kind of, uh, these cash injections, uh, Egypt would have gone under. And so we're still uh, under the, uh, going for these negotiations for a $4.8 billion uh, IMF loan, which would entail a government uh, reform package that would include austerity measures, subsidy cuts, tax hikes, uh, which uh, continue uh, many of the same neoliberal economic policies that stirred up this revolt in the first place. And let me just add quickly uh, on Egypt Independent, the importance of an outlet like this is that local Egyptian journalists um, who have the knowledge uh, of, of their country can tell their story to the world through outlets like Egypt Independent instead of being fixers for Western journalists uh, and having that, that, uh, that narrative translated through someone else. So this is the importance of, of, a, of an outlet like that. Sharif Abdul Kadus, Democracy Now! correspondent. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.